Well, the, the other thing um, that, that Julian couldn't remember the name of is uh, the element that's going to go into this wonderful vessel uh, at the end of my talk. Um, and if you think the first half of this lost lecture, uh, lost lectures was uh, random and eclectic, this lecture itself is going to be a sort of fractal, highly random and eclectic lecture, because I'm going to be talking about lots of different things. Um, and they've got a few points in common. Uh, one is that they're all things that I really enjoy doing. Um, none more so uh, than this, um, which is the way I spend um, uh, many a weekend um, photographing insects. And um, the insect I'm photographing there uh, is one of the rarest and most difficult and, and elusive and fantastic creatures in the British Isles. Uh, it's a purple emperor. It's a butterfly. It only flies for two weeks. It's coming up in about a month or so. Um, and it's, it, it, it engenders great passion among the, 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 the small community of nerds like me. Uh, there's a particular nerd there coming in with an iPhone. Um, <laughs> the, these butterflies only fly for two weeks of the year, and they spend all of their time uh, in the very, very tops of oak trees. Okay. And um, they only come down very briefly between about 10 o'clock in the morning and 11.30, and they'll come down attracted by dog feces. Uh, fox poo is particularly good. Uh, rotting carcasses. And uh, best of all, um, a, 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 some kind of a fish paste from an Indonesian uh, food shop. <laughs> and the holy grail is to photograph to get that purple flash in the wing. And in fact, it's, it, it's very hard to get the light just right. You can see the butterfly has to be in exactly the right position. So I was very pleased to do that. Um, now, actually, I've spent the last three years filming uh, butterflies, but I've also been filming um, bumblebees. And uh, we're, we're just about, in fact, to produce an app which I hope will allow people to identify bumblebees. Um, I should explain that um, if I switch to here, um, there are, in fact, uh, about 23 species of bumblebee in Britain. Um, they're not all the same. These are the six common ones. So I hope after this lecture you'll go into the garden on a sunny day and look at the bumblebees carefully. I know they're slightly frightening. Um, uh, this one uh, is the white-tailed bumblebee, Bombus leucorum. Uh, this one is the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. Uh, this is the spring bumblebee, Bumble, Bumble, Bombus praetorum. Um, bottom left, garden bumblebee. Bottom uh, is common carder. But this is the one I want to talk about. This bumblebee is um, the red-tailed bumblebee. And um, I'll show you some film, uh, part of what I've been shooting over the last uh, few years. Um, uh, and here you can see a queen that spent the winter. It had sex in the autumn. It then went and hibernated for six months. And it's just crawled out. And this enormous queen is now nectaring and will go off and build a nest. And in fact, um, there are two other British bumblebees that look almost exactly like this red-tailed bumblebee, but they're much, much more difficult to film. Look at the legs of this bumblebee and look at the wings and see if you can remember the features. Okay, the legs are plain black and the wings are quite clear. Now, if we have a look at the next species, uh, this I managed to film on Tyree. Um, I've been helped in this project by the head of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, who says when he dies and goes to heaven, if he's been good, he will end up on Tyree, because it's bumblebee paradise. And it's full of this wonderful creature, which is Bombus ruderarius. And ruderarius essentially means red. And if you look at the legs of this bumblebee, you will notice that on the bee's knees, there are red hairs. Red hairs. And I can't tell you how rare this bee is and how incredibly satisfying it is to actually go and manage to film it. Um, and I think, in fact, for those of you who are doubting, it's a bit windy. If we freeze it, you can actually see the red hairs on the leg of Bombus ruderarius. But there's actually an even more extraordinary bumblebee, uh, which is, again, very similar, red tail, black body. Um, and that's um, a, a cuckoo bumblebee. It's this one, a real monster, a real beast, called um, 
uh, Bombus rupestris. And it deliberately mimics the other two bumblebees, and it's a parasite on them. It's got armor plating. Um, you, you can see it's got quite smoky black wings. And it will go into the nests of the other bumblebees, kill the queen, lay its eggs, and then let the workers raise. You know, it's just like Ridley Scott's alien. Um, absolute beast. Um, so that's one project I'm working on at the moment, I'm, um, and uh, in, in, in enormously enjoyable. Um, but the second one, um, which I hope you agree has got absolutely no connection with bumblebees, other than that it's also about beautiful things, is with my company Touch Press. And we've been going for about two years. A bunch of us um, got together to make apps for the Apple iPad. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to launch this one, which is, um, we've been making it for about the last six months. And um, there are 23 species of British bumblebee, and there are 154 species of sonnets. So you can sort of begin to see a theme in my, my life. Um, these sonnets, we've uh, persuaded a group of uh, amazing people to um, uh, read them and perform them alive, aloud. Um, we've got a mixture of actresses, uh, actors, um, um, academics, uh, um, uh, a whole a range of, uh, of different people. Um, and um, Let's choose one which I suppose has got a very slight bumblebee connection. Um, it's the most famous sonnet, but I think it's also in many ways um, the most extraordinary sonnet because it's about immortality. And it's Shakespeare, if you listen carefully, it's about Shakespeare um, claiming, I guess, that his poetry is going to make the subject of his, his poem immortal. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, And often is his gold complexion dimmed, And every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance, or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fear thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this. And this gives life to thee. Now, we, we provide a set of um, uh, tools that allow you, if you want, to kind of dig into the sonnet and to begin to um, learn a bit more about it. If we go to, um, let's go to somebody else, to Simon Russell Beale, choose one of his sonnets. And now, I'll st stop him before he starts, but I can bring up... Um, the Arden notes, uh, you know, the wonderful, rich exploration of the, um, of the of, of each sonnet, and I can touch a note, and the text will be highlighted. Um, I hope you can see, and as I touch um, in something in the sonnet, the um, the, the uh, word will appear. Um, I can also, if I want, um, replace the modern typewritten text with the original 1609 quarto. Um, and um, um, I'm going to go now to sonnet 129. Um, and this one is read by um, an amazing um, woman from the Royal Shakespeare uh, Company. Um, she's the, the uh, voice coach uh, there. She's been there for many years. And something else that we include um, in this exploration of the sonnets is um, commentary on them. Um, so um, let's choose uh, people and find Sicily. And let's hear what she has to say about Sonnet 129. You open with a premise, like in Sonnet 129, which I, I work with a lot because it's so wonderful. And he says, the expense of spirit, spirit in that case is male semen, 
So he's actually meaning fucking. Is that a right thing? It's perfect, right? He's actually talking about f lust. So, um, Shakespeare's sonnets are not quite what they seem. There's a really interesting story behind them. Who were they addressed to? Was it a man? Was it a woman? An awful lot of the language is not, not clear. Um, so it's somewhat surprising. Um, anyway, uh, I could show you a lot more about that, but in the last few minutes of my talk, um, I'd like to show you um, another project that's consumed hours and hours of my time um, over the last few years. I'm still very much working on it actively at the moment. Um, and um, it's this project. It's, it's building a um, periodic table of element displays. And I've done it with um, an extraordinary fellow called Theodore Gray. Who you can see, this is, this is a picture that um, we took on an automatic camera at two in the morning, having worked for 10 days solid with no sleep to build this thing. And we started off with, um, linking back to the first lecture this evening, we started off with trees. And um, uh, if, if I whiz through, um, Theo came to fame because he built a periodic table table. <laughs> um, and he then collected lots of elements. And we then built displays. And in the displays, you don't just have the name of the element. You have the actual lump of stuff. And um, uh, we made books about it. And we made interactive displays. And one of the things that we wanted to put into our displays, because obviously you can't do chemistry live in a display that's in a public place, is we wanted to film interesting behavior of every element. And this evening, I'm really grateful to Hal Sosabowski and Dave Campbell, who I'd like to invite up on stage, who have come all the way from the University of Brighton on the south coast and brought with them an apparatus which will allow us to demonstrate a property of, I think, one of the most remarkable elements. I won't say it's my favorite element because it's very dangerous and unpleasant. Um, Hal, what element are we going to deal with today? We're actually looking at two elements. Now, this is an absolutely classic chemistry demonstration. And uh, I think far too much science has become uh, removed from reality. And so I very much hope that um, this experiment will work and that we'll see the beauty of chemistry. Um, because it's not just um, you know, about theory. Uh, it's also about a very aesthetic experience. And I think a lot of people like me who got very interested in chemistry did so precisely because of this um, uh, sort of experience. So Hal's pouring in to the vessel some liquid oxygen. It's actually a beautiful blue color. And what it's doing is it's filling the vessel um, with um, uh, an atmosphere of more or less pure oxygen. Now, I should warn you, in a moment we're going to ask the lights to go down. And we're going to put a piece of white phosphorus, which is a very toxic, very pyrophoric uh, flammable material into that atmosphere of oxygen and we're going to light it. Um, it will not explode, I hope. Um, the poisonous uh, nature will be uh, neutralized by the oxygen, but there may be some fumes that come out, so don't be alarmed if there's a bit of smoke. Uh, I apologize to the next two people giving lectures after this, but hopefully the smoke won't be too bad. Um, so um, we should Make sure the camera is uh, on and operating. Um, Hal, is there anything else you'd like to say before you start the experiment? Do you want to talk through what you're doing? Yeah, first and foremost, white phosphorus is one of three allotropes of phosphorus, the other two being black and red. And the problem, well, the first problem we're going to have is that white phosphorus normally spontaneously combusts in air. So the problem that Max or I are going to have is getting it from this jar into this receiving vessel. <laughs> Uh, well, I would recommend doing it quickly. I'm wishing you all the best of luck with that one, Max. Very good. Okay, so um, it's a kind of waxy uh, yellow substance, and if you leave it in air more than about five seconds, it will actually catch fire. It was used in incendiary bombs in World War II, he said, making a clever link to the second or third lecture. <laughs> no fatalities yet. <laughs> good. So that, that's, uh, that's the dodgy bit over. 
And now, um, Dave, you're heating uh, a copper wire, and just a touch with a warm copper wire should be enough to set this off. So now we need the lights to go down, please. When I light it. I'm so sorry. Lights back up again. <laughs> um, well done on lights. Very, very good reaction. Um, when, when I drop my hand, lights down. Now, the thing to watch is the beautiful shape of the smoke, which hopefully will form. The, the, the beautiful smoke is, is phosphorus pentoxide. And I th always think this experiment looks like a gorgeous jellyfish at this stage. And the name of the experiment is the phosphorus sun. And as the jar slowly and gradually fills with the smoke. Um, it's left as a kind of glowing orb. Um, I think it's one of the most beautiful chemistry demonstrations. And if you know the paintings um, of, of uh, sort of enlightenment era scientific experiments with young children's faces lit by the glow of a candle, Joseph Wright of Derby. I think Hal looks just like he's out of a Joseph Wright <laughs> painting. <laughs> Very good. Lovely experiment. And with, with that, I thank you very much indeed.